Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Mary Ann Hakes, and I represent Explorations on Aging in College Park. And Corridor Conversations is a set of Route 1 villages, as we call it, um, representing Hyattsville Aging in Place, University Park Helping Hands, College Park Neighbors Helping Neighbors. And we all work in various arenas to try to provide volunteer services to keep seniors, specifically to keep seniors living in place as long as they wish. Um, and we've done things together in the past. And so starting in February of this year, we've collaborated on Zoom with these um, various, we've had a series of corridor conversations and um, we, we intend to keep that up and we'll keep it up on Zoom. So um, uh, stay tuned, we'll, keep, we'll give you the, um, the schedule. Um, so today um, I wanna thank um, in particular Maryland um, Milestones who helped support this program. And then just to mention um, our next program is October 23rd. And um, that should be something you would eat before you join us, I would say, because the um, owner of Shortcake Bakery, which many of you may know on Route 1 in Hyattsville is going to be our speaker. And she's gonna kind of get us in the mood, I think, for um, holiday baking. So, um, so keep that in mind, or it may be Halloween baking, I'm not sure. But today we're delighted to welcome the College Park Air Museum um, into our midst. And for those of you that, um, I hope many of you have been over there, but um, we really do have a gem in our midst. Um, it's, um, I just have a couple of highlights, which Tom, I hope I don't steal your thunder here, but um, in 1911, um, it was the first Army Aviation School. Um, and it was the first testing for bomb aiming devices from airplanes. Um, inert bombs were dropped into the goldfish bonds at the end of the air, airfield using a bomb site developed by Riley Scott. Um, it's very interesting. The pond now is uh, part of a creek, I think. It's not a uh, pond. But um, 1912, it was the first mile high flight by a military av aviator. 1918 was the first US Postal Airmail Service. And I'm sure Tom will go into that. They have a really interesting um, exhibit on that. Um, it was also the first Army, a RV a Army Aviation School. Um, and it's the longest continuously operating airport in the world, I think world. Um, so I'm gonna let the expert talk about it rather than me. Um, I'd, so I'd like to introduce Tom Wilson, who is the museum educator, and Tom will take us on a virtual tour of the College Park Air Museum. Good. All right, guys, welcome to the College Park Aviation Museum, as Mary said. Uh, my name is Tom, I'm your tour guide today. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to shout them out, put it in the chat, however you wanna get it out, um, you guys, Whenever uh, Savannah's on camera, she'll be helping facilitate any questions or moderating. Hi, guys. Uh, if nobody has any questions, we're just going to go ahead and get started. I just ask that you guys stay on mute uh, unless you have a question. So uh, if you do not know, aviation deals with flight or the science of flight. Uh, before airplanes came around in the early 1900s, there were a couple of people that were flying prior to in dirigibles, like the Mont Pierre brothers. Uh, around 18th century France. Uh, we had a lot of people flying gliders like George Cayley, I'm sorry, George Cayley, Otto Lutzenthal, and Octave Chanute in the late 1800s. Uh, these were some inspirations to uh, the Wright brothers who would go on to fly their first flight on December 17th in 1903 in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And I even heard about a gentleman in the 12th century in like the Far East who was known for jumping from buildings and flying 200 meters. So kind of like a Superman, but I don't really know if that's about. So here we go. We were found in 1904 and pulled the right. However, before they filled their plane, they would write letters to the Smithsonian around 1899, and they would travel down to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, with these photos right here. They would go there for the next four years testing gliders and flyers to try to create the first heavier-than-air aircraft or the modern day plane as we might know. 
After about three years of testing gliders, they decided to put an engine on the plane, like the one we have over here in this model. You want to zoom in over there? And on December 17th, I mentioned they flew like it was only 12 seconds, so not a very long time. I just got back from a trip on a plane and my flight was eight hours. I wish it was 12 seconds, that would have been a lot more fun and quick. Uh, they flew about four feet off the ground. They flew four times that day. The furthest flight was about 58 seconds. So, very important, very inspirational. However, they flew a big off the Sports and loud. Uh, I think there's about 200 people that lived on the Outer Banks at this time. So there were not a lot of people that were there to witness their feet. So that was part of the reason why they chose Kate Hawkins. So the area, there's not a lot of people, not a lot of people to see what they're doing. They're very secretive. They're trying to get away with flying and nobody steal their ideas and create the first airplane prior to them. Uh, the second reason they chose Kate Hawkins is, is, according to the National Weather Service, the second windiest place in the United States. The first was out west, however, it was very hard to get to at the time. So this is why they chose Kitty Hawk. Uh, third reason here at the beach, if you're testing a anything that you're going off the ground and you're going to crash and land, sand is a lot softer than like hard rock or concrete, asphalt, etc. So, like I said, they flew four times that day, the longest being 58 seconds. After that fourth flight, their plane got hit by a gust of wind and it tumbled and rolled in the air and it was basically destroyed. So their only evidence they had was destroyed. There was nobody there to really witness this account. So when they tried to go to the army to sell their plane, what do you think the army said? No thing, you have no proof. So for the next couple of years, they were trying to figure out what they wanted to do. Around 1905, they tried to have people back up in Dayton, Ohio, where they were originally from, see them catch their plane. However, it never took off. So there was something in. Around 1906, they began traveling to Europe. They went to England, Germany, and France. They took their sister Catherine right with them because she was more of an outgoing person. Orville and Wilbur were kind of on the spectrum. They were very introverted, and they didn't like going to social gatherings, which if they were trying to get money to fund their research and their experiment, they were going to need that social aspect. So the English turned them down, the Germans turned them down, but finally the French said, let's give this flying machine a try. And when the United States government heard that, they said, hold on, if there are two Americans that are going to create a flying aircraft, we're going to be a part of it because this is the United States. You know, We're not letting anybody take our credit. So, in 1908, the United States Army held the first airplane trials, which we come down here. This took place in Fort Myers, Virginia, which is like Arlington area. Uh, they needed to be able to do five things to pass this test and get the contract. They needed to be able to have two people fly the plane. Uh, it needed to be easy enough that anybody could use it. It needed to travel at a speed of 40 miles per hour, be in the air for over an hour, and then travel at a speed of 125 miles per hour. 125 miles per gallon or tank. Excuse me, I'm probably over my words. They were able to achieve this and they were successful. So they ended up getting the Army contract. However, you guys can't really see because you're not here. At the bottom of this picture in Fort Myers, Virginia, we have a lot of buildings, uh, people, houses. So it's not a very it's a very urban area, and you don't really want to fly or test because you're going to crash a plane, which you know you don't want to do. Kill a lot of people. About seven thousand people showed up to this trial because nobody had ever seen an airplane fly. So this was a big deal. They flew at Fort Myers, Virginia, for a long time, not a long time, a short time. Uh, there was a very bad accident. Orville Wright was involved, and Thomas Selfridge tragically died. Orville ended up being with a cane for the rest of his life due to the injuries that he sustained. So after this incident, they were trying to find a place that was more spacious, more rural, but still within the Washington, D.C. area. 
So they set up one of their friends, uh, Lieutenant Frank Lamb, in a hot air balloon, which is somewhere on this wall behind me. Uh, he looked all around the area, and eventually they saw the University of Maryland Agriculture School had a lot of space and land. So that's where they decided to come. So behind me, behind this wall, is the College Park Airport. As Marianne mentioned, it is the world's oldest continually operating airport in the world. It said world twice there. Since 1909, so 112 years, every day this airport has been in operation. That is our big glory. Does anybody have any questions about the Wright Brothers, early aviation, the College Park Airport, and the founding? You can put your questions either in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself to, uh, to ask it, you can do that too. Were there any other competitors for the contract? Uh, yeah, there was a, a handful of people that also came out to fly, but unfortunately none of them succeeded the way the Red Brothers had. And I guess one fact I'd like to mention that I didn't say before, uh, nine days prior to the Wright Brothers' first successful flight on December 17th, Samuel Piermont Langley, who was the third secretary of the Smithsonian, was actually testing out his aerodrome on the Potomac River on a houseboat. Uh, this was his second attempt at launching, and he unfortunately did not succeed. He was getting all this federal government money being a Smithsonian worker. Uh, the United States Army War Department was also funding this because they were trying to get the next step to the battle. Uh, as you might know, some of the dirigibles or hot air balloons were used during the Civil War. So this could be the next step in the evolution of war. Uh, I think that's a very cool fact. Uh, Langley Air Force Base, a lot of places are named after him. He's a very successful uh, inventor, scientist. However, he did not succeed in being the first person to fly a heavier than air. Here, here. If anybody has no other questions, we're going to go on to the next part of the tour. This is Oroville. This is you know that he taught by at the uh, Terry Light School. Hey guys, Wilbur and I am. I might have mentioned that uh, Wilbur was going bald like I am, so he always wore a hat to protect himself from the sun. Very smart guy. Uh, here we are in the Wright Brothers Hangar. It's actually a replica of what it would have been like here back in 1929. Uh, Early aviation, early planes suffered a lot of problems, issues that they were constantly being repaired on. Uh, as you can see up here, here it is. <laughs> as you can see over here, we have a lot of tools that they would use back then. Uh, we have some color that Wilbur is currently working on. He's also wearing a mask for Wilbur, being great for all visitors. If you guys do not know what a propeller is, it helps propel the plane, gives it thrust to move forward, which will then give it the lift. Uh, there are a few things in this hangar that are a little odd. If you guys want to go ahead and guess, I know there's a TV over here that would not have been around in 1909. But is there anything else in here that's a little odd? Feel free to shout it out. Yes, the bed. Thanks for shouting out, guys. I appreciate it. Ah, so why would there be a bed in their hangar? It's a good question. Ah, again, the Wright brothers were very secretive, even though they had already received their army contract. They didn't want anybody else coming, stealing their ideas, getting a plane to work better than them. So they would leave at least one person, either Wilbur or Orville or some part of their crew. They would spend the night in the hangar in case anybody tried to sneak in. They would catch them and stop. I don't know if anybody actually breaking in and trying to steal any information from them, but I wasn't around back then. Uh, if nobody has any questions about our hangar, we're going to move on to the first plane on our tour.
So here we have the Wright Model B. This is the second aircraft the Wright Brothers created. Uh, the first one was that little model we looked at. It's known as the Wright Flyer. Uh, the big difference between these two planes is the elevator would have been in the front of the Wright Flyer. Here it is in the back. You guys might not be able to see it. And unfortunately, our cords are broken, so I cannot move it. But you can just imagine that splat in the back going up and down as it would be moved. This one here. So this plane was built in 1910. Uh, there was two bought by the Army in 1911 when they opened the Army Aviation School. There was a total of five planes used. Uh, as Mary Ann mentioned, in 1912, Pat Arnold, which fun fact, he's the only five-star general in the Army and the Air Force, flew this same plane, I think 6,500 feet in the air. As you can see, there's no seatbelts. Uh, he sat on a wing to do this, so he was pretty crazy. I would certainly not do that now. I always ask kids if they did. They said, oh, yeah, they're super brave. I'm like, no, thank you. I might not have mentioned the Wright Brothers were bicycle makers. Uh, three parts of this plane have bicycle parts. Uh, they were trying to cut costs as much as they could to help fund other stuff for the research. So if you look down at the bottom, the wheels would have been from bicycles back then. Up here, we also have gears and chains that would have been from bicycles. And the seats, even though they don't look like bicycle seats today, this is what they had back in the early 20th century. And if you guys kind of look more at the plane itself, a lot of people believe that this is made out of steel or metal. However, it's not, it's made out of wood. They painted it this color, silver, uh, again, to be deceptive. Um, they know they couldn't prevent people from seeing their plane or pictures of their plane. However, if it appeared to be made out of metal or steel, somebody tried to replicate it, it would be too heavy, it would have blocked. Uh, at the time, the engine was not strong enough to really propel a plane that heavy, so they were using wood. Another part of the plane is the white part, makes us the wing. Uh, this is made of canvas. It's like a cloth, like a shirt. Uh, if it's to rip or tear, it's easy to fix. You just sew it back together. They initially tried on their gliders and testing paper. However, paper tears easily. Uh, if it rains, it's completely destroyed. And they basically would have to rebuild the entire wing when they use paper. So using canvas, it was much smaller repair, cheaper, more effective. And then you guys look real hard. All these lines through the wing are ribs. Uh, the Wright brothers were also inspired by birds. Birds have sturdy ribs. It helps provide structure for their body. So the ribs will help provide structure for the wings. And the wings aren't flat, they're kind of curved, similar to birds. It's able to help catch the wind easier. And they have space between them, so it's hollow, lighter weight. Again, if it's too heavy, it's not going to fly. You need to cut as much weight as possible. Anybody have any questions so far? So I'm going to show you how the controls work on this plane. It's very simple. Uh, there's three levers. If you're sitting in either seat, the outside one works both sides. Uh, that would move the elevator. Unfortunately, it's not hooked up right now. So we're just going to pretend that you're looking at the back of the plane and the elevator is moving up and down. Why it's called an elevator? Oh, good question. Like elevators in the building, it's going to help go up or down. Uh, the next control is the rudder. Again, it's kind of hard to see, but it's similar to a rudder on a boat. It's really just going to help steer right to left. And then there is one more control. And this is known as wing warping. You're literally warping the entire wing, uh, similar to how a bird turns. They don't just like that, 
One goes up, one goes down. However, this is very expensive. You have to turn the entire, or morph the entire wing of the plane. Most planes nowadays have ailerons. If you look right above us, this is one of the first planes that have an aileron. This will just turn that one flap. It's the same type of system we use on modern day planes. Uh, again, you're not moving the entire wing. So it's cheaper, it's easier, more reliable. However, this plane I just showed you, built by Glenn Curtis, one of the competitors to the Wright brothers, got into a big argument, a legal battle with Orville and Wilbur, saying that this plane is the exact replica of the Wright B. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I don't believe it. They look pretty different from my perspective. This created what is known as the patent wars. And instead of advancing technology in aviation, the Wright brothers and Glenn Curtis basically went to battle the two earliest aviation engineers. And this kind of slowed down progress. Eventually though, when they both got contracts with the United States Army, they had a combined forces and they became the Curtis Wright Company or Wright Curtis Company. And they're still in existence today, not what it was back then. I think that's pretty fun. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the right model V? So what uh, what were the innovations or differences between that and the first flyer? So basically, you have a different engine that's added on, more powerful, but still not a lot. I think it was like eight horses. Uh, the elevator, which is in the back of the plane, was originally in the front of the plane on the right flyer, but moving it to the back made it more easier to control uh, steer that it's not in front of you, which would cut back on weight when you're moving forward. And then if you guys can really see, there's two propellers on the back. I don't know if you wanna go around to the side. Uh, this would have been known as a pusher plane. Nowadays, most propellers are on the front of the planes. And they are known as polar planes. But yes, any other questions? Would anybody fly in this plane? Or am I on the air? Any volunteers? Not me. <laughs> I'd rather hang glide. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have a question, but Corey says, thrilled to hear about the Wright brothers and Dayton, Ohio, where I worked for 14 plus years at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Oh, pretty neat. Right. So, so because of the Wright brothers, the airport came to into existence. Yes. So in 19, 1908, they had a bad accident at Fort Myer, Virginia. And right, right. A place that was more spacious, and this is the space they ended up finding. If we look outside right now, uh, we can see the run. Oh, if we move over here. <laughs> yeah, go over this way a little bit. Okay. Uh, the runway runs this way now. Uh, originally, when it came here in 1909, it ran perpendicular. Uh, there is the old Baltimore and Ohio Railroad all the way at the end, which is now like green line on the metro. So that's the original runway or where it would have been. And now this is the modern airport. The closest road to us is the taxiway and the furthest way is the runway. And then the compass rows here is on the ground to tell pilots which direction is north. Yeah, that's why we're here. Uh, our next plane that we're going to be talking about is the Curtis Jenny or JN4D. Uh, this plane was built by Glenn Curtis, who I talked about earlier. With the Curtis Pusher Model B, which was the other plane we were looking at. This plane was built about four years after the right Model B, but you can already see there's a lot of differences. Yes, the color is different. Uh, Thank you. 
<laughs> All right, I do not have my. Uh... Oh, hang on, give me one second. <laughs> I'm so prepared for today's tour. Now he's throwing things. So, I'm gonna come a little closer. So, uh, right model B, still canvas. Uh, they didn't add any additional layers of paint. As you can see, the more you add, the more it looks like a material. That's basically what they did on the Curtis Jenny. Uh, this helps re uh, repel water, makes it more resistant uh, to the weather. This initial paint or canvas does resist. Uh, they would have added like a black onto it, but it's not as protective as what this plant has. So that's a small evolution over a couple of years. Also, now we have a fuselage and a cockpit. So instead of sitting on the wings of a plane, we have a seat to sit in. Does anybody know what seat the pilot would sit in, the front or the back, any guessers? Throw your hand up if you think they sat in the front seat. Or you can throw your hand up now if they sat in the back seat. Your yeah, back seat. The back seat. Yeah. So if you guys look over here, if you're sitting in the front seat and you look down, you're going to see the wing of the plane. Uh, back in the day, they didn't have GPS, they didn't have iPhones. They needed to use uh, landmarks as places of reference. So if you're flying without being able to see, a mountain could appear out of nowhere and you can crash and land, and, or not land, you crash and we all know what happens with that. So they would sit in the back, you're able to see more. And when they use maps in this plane, because it was the open cockpit, elements and wind happen, rain, et cetera, they would actually have the jacket on, like our guy behind me, and they would have the map sewn in on the inside of the jacket. Still a biplane, so they both have two wings. Well, the uh, propeller is now on the front of the plane versus being in the back, so it's going to help pull it versus push it. This plane was originally built for World War I. However, it never got to Europe. Uh, about 90% of the pilots from America and Canada flew in a plane similar to this or this plane. Uh, it was mainly used for reconnaissance. However, it never saw battle. Uh, in 1918, the war ends and there is a surplus of planes. So the government ends up selling them as cheap as $5 back in 1918. I don't know the equivalent of that now, maybe a couple hundred dollars. Uh, so a lot of people are able to purchase this plane. Uh, one of those people are the United States Post Office Department and they begin to fly airmail. We just celebrated the hundred and third anniversary of the first postal airmail flown up College Park Airport here through Philadelphia up into Long Island, New York. Another reason or another use of this plane was by barnstorming. Uh, people like Bessie Coleman, who was the first African-American woman and first Native American to receive a pilot's license, flew in this plane, kind of like stunt pilot stuff. Uh, they literally got the name of barnstorming because they would sit at a barn, they would open both sides of the doors, and they would fly through the building. And this was pretty cool in the early 20s. Anybody that lived in a rural area has never seen people fly before, really, unless you live in a big city. Uh, so the pilots like Bessie and others would fly into small towns. They would charge a nickel. You could climb into the plane, look at it, or they would charge like a quarter, and they could take you up in the air and fly around the area. I think it's pretty neat. I wish we could fly for that cheap now. It'd be great. Travel more. Ah, what else? Any questions about this plan? Sorry, any questions in general? What material was made, was used to fabricate the fuselage? So it's mainly still made of wood and canvas. And then they use that paint different layers and it would help stir it and make it propellant. Uh, most of the planes in here that we have are all made out of wood minus like two. So it wasn't until like the 30s or 40s you get adding like metal onto planes.
Any other questions? So five dollars in nineteen eighteen is about ninety dollars today. Wow, you guys could have your own plan for ninety dollars. <laughs> That'd be pretty neat. All right, we can move on to the next aircraft. Does anybody have any guesses as to what this is? Feel free to shout out. It looks dangerous. Yes, it does. <laughs> so this is the Berliner helicopter, the fifth one they built. Uh, Henry and Emil Berliner were a father-son duo. Uh, Emil Berliner came from Germany. He found money in record players, basically built those, patented them, made a lot of money. Uh, we talked about the Army purchasing planes previously. Well, the Navy was also interested in purchasing planes, or aircraft, I would say. Uh, a lot of ships back then, you know, there's not a lot of space to take off. So they're looking for something that can have vertical lift, like a modern day helicopter. However, they didn't have helicopters back then. But the Berliners took a Newport fuselage, which is a French plane. Uh, they added an additional flap in the middle, which you guys might be able to see. So it looks like it's a triplane. And on the very top are two very large propellers. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of hard to see from here. But the propeller goes all the way to here on that side and all the way to here on this side. And if you can kind of see our pilot is about six inches from getting his head cut off. So yes, it's a very scary track. Uh, so in 1924, they tested it here. They had the Navy here to see. Uh, it flew about 15 feet in the air. They could go up, they could go forward, they could go backwards, they could go side to side. There was one direction they couldn't go, and that was down. <laughs> so the son was in the helicopter flying, and he was basically radioing to his father, what do I do? He said, kill the engine. So Henry cut the engine off and basically crash landed the helicopter. It did not destroy it, thankfully, so we still have it here on display. Uh, but he didn't really fly after that. And it wasn't until 1939 when Igor Sikorsky invented the real first helicopter or modern helicopter that we know today. Uh, unfortunately, the Navy did not purchase this due to certain reasons. And it is still here and it's coming up on its 100th anniversary of its first flight outside here at College Park. Anybody have any questions about that? And there is a video of this flying. If you Google Berliner 5 helicopter, it'll come right up. It goes a couple feet in the air, comes right back down. All right. If you guys look up above us, uh, we have our Monocoupe 110. This was a popular plane in the 30s and 40s. Uh, took part in a lot of air races here. The difference is this is the first enclosed cockpit. Uh, most of the planes up until the 19-teens, 1920s, were open cockpit. People were kind of getting tired of the elements. Like I showed you our pilot over here in front of the Jenny. He had on his hat, his goggles, his jacket, his scarf, to keep him warm, wipe off any bugs that hit his goggles. Finally, 20, 30 years later, we have a plane enclosed. You don't have to worry about the elements and it continues on like that for the rest of the planes that we're gonna be looking at. Uh, above me is a Boeing PT-17 Stearman. Uh, this plane was flown mainly in the 40s. I think it was built in 19, 
36. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, the women's air service pilots were very prevalent to fly in this. Also, the Tuskegee Airmen did a lot of training in this style of plane. However, this specific plane flew over the North Pole in 2000 uh, by a man by the name of Gus McLeod. Uh, you guys might not be able to see, but part of the engine is duct taped. Uh, they were trying to keep as much heat in it as possible. It was very miserable. It's very cold. I haven't been to the North Pole. I've flown kind of near it, but I don't think I would go in an open cockpit plane. Uh, he succeeded in flying over the North Pole. Nothing went really bad. Uh, he did kick out the second seat to add additional room for fuel. Uh, however, he did have to land the plane kind of in a scary moment. Landed on an ice cap, basically. They came back to get the plane like the next day after they had retrieved whatever parts they needed to fix it. Uh, the plane was gone. Uh, the ice cap kind of broke off the glacier and floated 70 miles closer to Norway than where they left it. Eventually, Gus McLeod found the plane. He flew it back and they landed here at College Park and it has been on display since then. So that's pretty cool local history. Gus McLeod lives out in like Gaithersburg, I believe, or he did at the time. Any questions about the North Pole? If anybody wants to come down here and take it for a flight over the North Pole, I'm sure we don't mind. It might be a little chilly. If not, we can go on to the next one. And the NP on its tail actually stands for North Pole. All US planes have N or NC. Uh, there, each country has their own code, and then they added NP for this one when it went to the North Pole. Are those the original colors of the plane, or? Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. So this is how it would have been. You can see, like, the Army star at the bottom and the U.S. Army, or I guess you can kind of see it. Uh, this is how it would have been painted in the 40s. The only thing that's different is the NA N8 NP. I think they changed that after it flew over the North Pole. And then our last plan that we're going to talk about is the Earth Coop. Uh, I talked about the Berliners. Emil and Henry, the son Henry, is the one that crashed the helicopter. Uh, he was not a big fan of flying after that, so he went on to invent the safest plane in the world. Uh, this plane was built actually in Riverdale, Maryland. I think it's like a mile from here. Um, I'm not really familiar with the area, but I believe there's a Whole Foods now where the factory used to be, and there's a plane that sits up on a sign so you can see the original location of where it was built. Uh, this plane was built in like 1939. They brought in a guy named Fred Week. He used to work for NACA, which precursor to NASA. Uh, he was a very good engineer. Basically, they built this plane where you could use only the controls in your hands. So there's no foot pedals. Uh, we had a lady actually by the name of Jessica Cox that doesn't have arms. She flew in in an air coop last summer to our airport, which was another first, at least for here. I think it's pretty neat. Uh, also on the back, you can see there's like two tails. Uh, if you're coming in and it's super windy, you can actually land this plane sideways. It just has that ability to adapt. Again, creating it and making it the safest airplane. Uh, this plane grew to popularity in the 40s. Uh, you could even purchase it at Macy's. Uh, they thought this plane was going to be the next thing for cars. Cars will be replaced. However, the Interstate Highway Act got signed in like 1950 something. And not a lot of people have planes in the garage anymore, mainly just cars. Pretty cool concept. Uh, a lot of these planes don't exist anymore. There wasn't a lot built. Uh, we do have occasionally a bunch fly in. Uh, one year we had about 68 or people fly in. I think that was about like 2000. So, does anybody have any questions about the Earth Coop or the Steerman or any of the other planes that we talked about? Tom, I just have a comment about the <coughs> Airco Field, which is down the street from me. Um, it now is Whole Foods and, and um, Gold's Gym and all of that. 
but apparently um, they worked 24 seven in the thirties and during World War II to, to manufacture these and get them out. My cousin um, flew them um, much later, but um, he, he was actually a pilot with Flying Tigers, but he actually flew the Airco Coupe. And he said it was the easiest thing to fly. It was, it was just real, you could manipulate it. It handled well. Um, he said it was easier than driving a car. So <laughs> quite, a, quite a little thing. And it yeah. does fly at the, there was a pole at the, um, down at Whole Foods and, and the, the propeller goes and it flies. So. <laughs> yeah, I've been told that. I've never made it down there, but I think that's pretty neat that it's still there. It's really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, if nobody has any other questions, we're going to go look at uh, one of our newest exhibits. Uh, I'll briefly go over it. I don't know all of it, but I will share as much as I can with you guys. Maybe Savannah will chime in too. So if you guys want to follow me as we go upstairs. Now, I don't know if you can see on the stairman where the cockpit is. There used to be an additional seat in front of that, and that's where they added the uh, additional fuel. Welcome. So this is our Tales of Flight exhibit. It's the newest exhibit to the College Park Aviation Museum. Uh, if you don't, can't tell by the pictures, it deals with animals in aviation. Uh, people have always painted animals on their planes or ships, kind of like mascots. This is kind of the same idea. Uh, even started with Wilbur and Oral, they had animals. Uh, in 1908, after Oral had crashed that plane, and Thomas Selfridge had passed away. He was alone in France. Again, he was an introvert. He was very shy, didn't like talking to other people. So he ended up being a flyer, which was his dog, kind of helping soothe him. Uh, same happened with Orville. He purchased a St. Bernard in 1912 after Wilbur had passed away. And I think this kind of just helped them deal with stress. And they were even known to fly occasionally. Uh, I don't think the Humane Society is a real big proponent of animals flying or being used as mascots. However, in the early 19-teens, like our World War I, uh, they weren't really around. People could kind of do whatever. There wasn't any laws preventing you from doing stuff like getting a lion or a lion cub to a military base. Uh, pretty cool fact. There's two lines for the Lafayette the Scoville. Uh, which was a French flying, French foreign legion. Um, I think it was two Americans were part of it. Uh, their lion cubs were named Whiskey and Soda. Fun fact, they had one, but they had to get another. You know, Whiskey had to have a friend. As you can see, some of the other service animals. Uh, the Red Baron, a very well-known pilot. He even got his dog, Moritz, who was a Danish hound. Uh, we also have Eugene Bullard, who it is up for debate, might have been the first African American to receive his pilot's license. Uh, unfortunately, he had to go to France to get it because they're very prejudiced here in the United States. Uh, Bessie Coleman, again, she had to go to France to get her license. Uh, but he had a little monkey named Jimmy, and that was his companion on his plane. 
he used to put Jimmy in his coat and take him on combat missions. Oh, uh, we had another pilot named Roscoe Turner. He had a lion cub named Gilmore. Uh, however, cubs don't last forever. They become lions, as you might see. Kind of hard to fly with. Uh, this is where like human society started to get like involved in the 30s. So they thought a good idea would be to get the cub a parachute. This was built by the Urban Company. Uh, there is a stuffed Gilmore at the Smithsonian. However, it's kind of hard to move now. It's 90 years old. So you can actually come see Gilmore's parachute here at CFAM. <laughs> and you can also see the logo of the lion on the back of his plane. We also had other animals, not just lions. Uh, we even had kangaroos. Kittens, uh, some of these service dogs that were used during the first war, they even went on to get awarded uh, 70 times during World War One. We had dogs, pigeons, horses, cats honored for their service fighting. Uh, animals don't always fly anymore, uh, some do for service animals. However, we do use dogs at airports. Uh, here's our very own arrow. He is our protector. Uh, if they're geese out on the runway or deer, he goes after them, chases them away, makes sure it's safe to land here. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram also. He has his own. And if you guys want to find out more, just come check it out. This exhibit is now open. Just started uh, a couple months ago. So, uh, Does anybody have any other questions regarding aviation, the airport, uh, tales of flight? Uh, Tom, can you give people an idea of exactly where y'all are located and how it's uh, best to get over there? Yeah, so we're at 1985 Cooper Frank Scott Drive. However, if you're familiar with the College Park Metro Station, we're basically across the street from there. Uh, there's like a little business or not business industry right in front of us. We're all the way in the back. You can either type in our address or the airport, and we're right next door to the airport. It's actually... But Technically, too, off-campus drive, um, if, you're, if you're cutting across, like, from between Route 1 and Kenilworth Avenue, um, yeah. you, you turn on Francis. It's right near the um, junior the tennis, tennis, the junior tennis um, yeah. uh, whatever you call them, those tent things. Um, I was just thinking, imagine what TSA would do with all those animals today. I can't imagine <laughs> they'd be letting a kangaroo on a plane. But, uh, yeah, probably they'd probably not. better behave than the passengers, as I understand. For sure. And in December, we will be having our animal week. Uh, so each day we'll have a craft for the kids that focuses on a different animal from our Tales of Flight exhibit. Um, so you can find more information on that on our Facebook page. Um, and that should be shared uh, a little bit later in the year, but that'll be like the week before Christmas. Great. And Tom, I, I don't know, I don't mean to get you off topic, but do you want to mention the um, Latina in aviation? Uh, yes. Yeah. So October 2nd, which is next Saturday, it is a all day event. Uh, it's our Latinas in landing, her I'm sorry, Latinas in Aviation. Uh, it was a book written by 22 women in aviation uh, last year during the pandemic. Uh, I believe 16 or 17 of them will be here. Uh, they'll be speaking, uh, meeting with kids, doing all kinds of events. It's a free all day event. I think it runs from 10 to four. Uh, I believe there'll be food, drinks, games, uh, crafts. 
uh, all kinds of stuff. This is a big deal for us. Uh, we're looking at a minority community and really embracing them and what they've done and accomplished in our field. Uh, so if you're not doing anything next Saturday, uh, I believe most of it will be outside, so you don't have to worry about being mm -hmm. too close to people and socially distancing, which is nice. Uh, feel free to check out the website or our Facebook for more information on that. Uh, but yeah, it'll be next Saturday, the 2nd from 10 to 4. Yep. No pre-registration is needed. Admission is free for the museum, so you can come see us in person, too. Come say hi, too. <laughs> My name is Savannah. Is parking available? So come say hi. <laughs> uh, yes, there is parking available. I think there also is a lot up front that will be used. Um, I know there might be a helicopter flying in that you might be able to like. Yes, the Navy helicopter use, uh, will be here. So yeah, it's going to be a big, big event. Will they be giving rides on the Navy helicopter? Uh, no, I, you might be able to like get inside the helicopter, but <laughs> they can't do flights out of here anymore. <laughs> Being as we're in a restricted zone close to DC. But yeah, if you guys don't mm -hmm. have any other questions or comments, I think that's all I have for today. Yeah. Uh, just, just one. Go ahead. Uh, um, but you, you just were mentioning the uh, being in a restricted zone. Um, how how much has uh, you know post 9-11 cut down traffic at the airport and things? Uh, so it's greatly impacted the airport. Uh, prior to 9-11, uh, maybe peak, there was about 130 planes at the airport. Uh, right after, there was a, a small window where people could leave the airport if they wanted in October of 2001. Uh, after that window, there was about 15 planes left here. Uh, a lot of the businesses that were on the other side of the airport are no longer here because you can't work on planes if there are no planes. Uh, since 2008, there has been a permanent uh, air defense zone or identification zone. Uh, we're in the smaller fall zone known as the FRZ or the flight restricted zone. And that's the center point is the DCA or Ronald Reagan Airport. And it goes about 15 nautical miles from there. So anybody within that circle, which is our airport, uh, Potomac Airfield and Hydefield, and then two other uh, military airports, basically you have to have a long vetting process to fly in here. Uh, TSA has to approve you. You have to be fingerprinted. You have to get a pin. Uh, you have to get approved. It's a very long process. Uh, since 9-11, we have had a growth. There's about 40 planes here on the airport now. Uh, people flying here every day, which is pretty cool. But I don't think it will ever get back to pre-9-11 status. Well, aren't you now using it or is it, is, I think it, is it the Coast Guard? Somebody's um, using it as training for helicopter flights? Uh, Maybe we do have the Prince George's County Police helicopter. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. They're on the other side. Uh, but not long ago, we had a uh, immigration and customs had a couple of Blackhawks here during the inauguration. Uh, we've had Coast Guard helicopters flying here. Uh, I've seen a couple other Army helicopters in and out occasionally. They'll come test, them, just drop down and head out. So still very active. Well, the airport also had a really strong safety record, as I recall, but I had a neighbor who used to tell, and I don't, I'm trying to remember if she actually witnessed it. Apparently, there was a small plane crash as they were taking off, I think, right at the corner of Queens Chapel Road and Route 1. Um, I don't know, and this would have been probably in the 30s or the 40s. Excuse um, me, that, that was around 1950. Oh, was it? A neighbor gave me a copy of the article or showed it to me. Um, and you're right, it was at Queen's Chapel on Route 1. No. Yeah. Or, now we just have cars crashing there since no one <laughs> pays attention to the light. Um, uh, but it was a military plane, so it's mm. it interesting, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's wonderful that uh, park and planning, I think, saved the airport, didn't they? I think they bought it maybe in the 70s or something. And um, and then our 
well, you're part of park and planning, so they built the museum and stuff. I mean, it's really um, yeah. So there, there was the campaign to save the airport back in like the late '60s, and then I think park and planning acquired the airport uh, somewhere in the early '70s, like 2071, yeah. 74, maybe. Uh, the first museum was actually in a trailer, and I think that opened in the mid '80s. And then our current building we're in was built or completed in 1998. So we've been in here just over 23 years. Yeah. So, and the, what, what's the new building? Is that administration where you have the auditorium and or the so next, rooms and next stuff? Store we have the operations building because they yeah. used to be in there too. That opened in 2015. Yeah. Uh, pretty state of the art, I would say. They have all the fancy stuff over there next door, but they left us hanging. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we're open um, Tuesday through Sunday, 10 to 4. You don't have to get any pre-registration to come visit the museum right now. Uh, masks are required. Social distancing is taking place. We're cleaning the museum. Uh, as you can see, not really a lot of people in here during the week right now because the school's back. So this would be a prime time to come visit if you guys would like to see the museum. and You can see me or Savannah. <laughs> we can talk your ear off if you really like. And you can do your grocery shopping at Whole Foods when you're finished. <laughs> <laughs> Check out the flying, Erica. Um, take, a, take a selfie with the air coop. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, thank, thank you, Tom, very much. This was, this was great. You're um, and we look forward to um, seeing and Abby, all of you and more, if you'd like, on the October um, 23rd. Carter Conversations, which, as I say, will be Shortcake Bakery. Um, Thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom.